George was one of the first people I met online who worked with me on lots of creative things. So obviously he's one of the first people I need to interview for this. Okay, George, um, I'm not sure how you uh, want to share your ideas because you have so many, but can you try to explain to us um, how your dream of edupreneuring and creating communities online developed and your idea of fun and entertainment? Well, <laughs> you don't ask much in one interview question, do you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can take it as simply as yeah, you like. Okay, I'll go. I just, I just had to say that. Um, <laughs> about four years ago, I started online myself, and it was a long learning curve. But one of the things that I discovered rather quickly was that um, the Internet is a very individualistic, very open, but um, not an organized system to connect with people. Certainly there are portals where people can meet, there are um, social sites where people can meet, but there's there was no good way to work together. And I discovered that working alone was certainly possible, but the community effort of people of like mind and like interests and like hearts were not able to connect well because there was no structure involved. So that was the start of trying to figure out ways to work together. The fun thing is just part of the package with me. I am not a disciplined person. I am not a highly focused person. But when something is fun and I can get engaged in a fun activity, that's where I gravitate to. So that just came along as part of the package called George. Okay, yes, and that's the best part of the package, I think, and what makes you so popular online and in with IQ. Uh, the next two questions might be less intuitive for you because you're all about the fun part. And the other questions are about um, the other important parts that Disney said we need uh, for success. He says we need to be a realist, so we put on the realist hat and um, take our head out of the clouds and see what we can really do. Um, so how do you do that? Do you think that um, you've kind of developed your practical side as well? Well, once again, there's two tracks. The classroom dynamic, which I think I'm a natural for, but that certainly took a lot of effort to learn the virtual world. Um, many people think that you lose things when you go into a virtual world, but truthfully, it's like that movie um, Avatar. If you go with a preconceived idea of what this new world is called online learning and teaching, then you're going to constantly try to fit a square peg into a round hole. Certainly, we're still humans online, but the the world is really, it's a different world. It's an alternate reality, this virtual reality. So there's a lot of practical things that I had to learn, as well as how to um, affect relational dynamics. And... Um, that continues to be a challenge for me. On the other side of the um, equation, this working together within a group, that's something that the realities quickly came, came to the fore, which is not technology dependent, it's social group dependent, and how to affect social connections. And I think working relationships, one of the things that I found with myself as well as almost every other teacher is that we don't play well together. We've, we've both as individual learners online, but definitely as teachers, we're used to being in charge and wanting to do things our way. So for everybody, myself included, trying to discover how to work in a group setting, uh, mutual goals is something that became a very big challenge and a harsh reality that still has not been affected other than certain specific areas of excellence. For instance, 
the new thing that um, Kirsten is doing now so that we as individual entrepreneurs or edupreneurs are able to work together towards a common goal of achieving a I'm going to say a bigger footprint a bigger presence online to be able to be found because there's just too big of a world out there online did I get anything close to yes, what your question was? Yeah, lots, <laughs> lots of lots of stuff. And what, what struck me was that um, from watching you work and from my own experiences, I think that being realistic online is about experimenting. So nothing is cast in stone. We yeah. can't say this is done or this is the way because there is no way. So it's all about experimenting and then we see the realities like you've seen many since I met you in the last two years and I've seen my own. Um, so there may be experiments and see what goes well and what doesn't go well. But uh, so you, you're still um, set on community building, but this time with Kirsten's website, it's about uh, teachers working together or sharing ideas. There's two sides of the equation for me, how to work with other people. I am satisfied, at least for me in a business sense, that I do not have the time, I do not have the wherewithal, I do not have the knowledge base of marketing and attracting students and working within a organizational, well I don't like to use that, but a a community attempt to educate and to work together and so I need to work with other people and I'm still trying to find how I can connect with other people online and um, uh, both with business builders and with individual students and the flip side of that, well, I forget. Well, the the main thing for me is that we have all, are all a product of institutionalized education systems, and that served the world very well, and it still serves the world well. Uh, if you want to get in three years, you want to become a professional, or four years, this traditional schooling system is still one of the most efficient, but online it really doesn't equate well it's a new world of individuals being empowered to connect and to be educated and so there's first of all there's no one best method that's a, a fallacy that only works in a forced institutional setting with everyone having free choice everyone having the ability to find what works for them things open up both for the student and the teacher I find that I do not have to be a grammar teacher, an English grammar, grammarian. I do not have to be a um, lecturer, even though I'm talking too much now. <laughs> yeah. um, that, that, that there's thousands of grammar teachers out there. What is unique about me and what can I serve that I enjoy? Now, because it's a world community, hopefully there's a way we can find and connect and best serve the constituents, the students, with what we are best able to perform or to um, offer so that we as teachers do not have to be everything for anybody, everybody anymore. We can work with our passions and our strengths and best serve the, the world community rather than having to set up a class that 100 students come in and we serve all of them. Now we can say, if you're not interested in fluent speaking and casual fun activities, which is very understandable, that's the way most people grow up in school, well then don't come to my class. You don't have to come to my class, you know, and I don't have to teach you because that's not my strength. Yes, okay. yes, um, I, I agree completely with that. I think being on the internet gives us all the freedom to develop ourselves as teachers and attract the students who can fit in with the way we do things and like you said there's no best way because even in this article that I'm going to write with you and uh, Fluency MC and um, Mark Buckler, Pin and Trip and Kirsten Winkler um, we are all so different and everybody has so much that's just really brilliant to share um, so we can't judge one over the other but we all have to find find who follows and who wants to do that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's... I it's, think, too, that yes. you brought up experimenting. Yeah. Um, 
one of the things that I drilled into you and everybody <clears throat> is to discover a fun dynamic, to discover what's best for the individual student, we had to discover their sense of fun. And one of the things that most of us have lost by the time we become an adult, particularly in the educational system, is what is fun. We always want to start with our agenda, our yeah. curriculum, our perception of what has to happen to be a successful learner. And that is a long-term thing. And I think that's still one of the key things that we as mentors or as teachers bring to the table, the big picture. But everybody lives in the now. And classes are held in the now. The more structured we are and come in with a set of assumptions about what has to happen, the less able we're able to be flexible and to be fun. Fun is almost a, a natural thing when people lighten up. And so that experimenting and even starting out a class with, we're going to do songs today. We're going to do a crossword puzzle today. We're, we have to remain flexible enough to be sensitive to what's working in today's class. Even if a student did fine five days in a row, day number six, they might be off for some reason. How flexible are we? How willing are we to be in that ex constant experimental mode to find out what's going to work today? I don't know. Yes, well, you know, I was thinking that part of this experimenting should happen with real schools um, in blended learning, like uh, real schools and teachers should connect with uh, teachers online and bring us into their classrooms and then we can ask children how they have fun and what they do and develop it from children's perspectives you know I think I would like the future I would like my children to have schools where there is blended learning and they get proper influence from the internet with teachers who know how to do it and who know how to share what do you think of that for the future I it's almost a, a non-starter, a counterproductive. Um, the, the world of regular schools is so regimented and so entrenched in its systems that, sure, there are spots of light, but simply in a classroom, in, in a regimented seating style, with an authority figure, with having to be at school on time, with time constraints and all of those things, it's almost the antithesis of free freedom and pursuing what we're passionate about. There's, I don't know how to, I don't yeah. know how that would work. So I think you mean that if they wanted to start blended learning and choose a teacher to go into their classrooms virtually, uh, we would have to follow their guidelines and lesson plans and do exactly what they say. Um, when you talk about completely unstructured environments, it's like that thing uh, that Mao Buckler did a few years ago that's on my article soon to be published, where he had a, um, a lounge where people came in and out and they had subscriptions like joining the gym or something. So that was something like that. And in Sweden, uh, they, they're supposed to have uh, new types of schools with lots of rooms and places to play. And they have taken away all the structure from the classrooms. So that's on an article I read. So I can send that to see what Truthfully, you think. Truthfully, in America, there's been a very large movement towards homeschooling. And I won't go into what that is, but uh, that is minimal structure and almost from day one the children are learning how to self guide themselves certainly the parents involved from day one these are what your tasks are for today but they're afforded the freedom to pursue it how and when they want that's an that's going to raise a generation of self starters self directed learners um, as they get older, and you know that I'm in love with Sugata Mitra, primarily because of his discoveries, not yeah. his exact plans. But I've told people before, it's not who has the answers. Every time we fall into the role of being the answer man for people, being the Google, the live Google system for people, we are taking away the one thing that they need is to be self-enabled learners. 
And so I constantly, and I don't want to be a facilitator. I don't want to be a student's friend. I want to be friendly. I still am a mentor. I am a guide. I am a leader. But I'm not their friend. I'm not their facilitator. Um, what I, and I think Sugata Mitra particularly brought out is, it's my task to discover the best question, not the answers. Yes, it's their task that. to yeah. find the answers. Certainly, different still students need help, but by us always interjecting ourselves as an authority figure, the answer man, then they do not seek each other. That's the power of the future, is that connectivity and being able to work within groups. That's the future. Certainly, people are going to be individually pursuing things, but how and when we involve them in group learning and group activities, I think that it's such a powerful, powerful concept of the best question wins the day, not the best answer. Because we're finding, and I don't mean to be in a a, a worldview of postmodernism and relativism, but we're in a world where people being empowered by um, social networks and the internet are now finding that they can do so much more themselves and with their own group dynamic that the sooner we get into that, the better for the students, I think. And there's much deeper learning that takes place in a social setting than an individualistic system. It's so sad to see that we bring 20, 30 young people alive with passions and interests and the adventure of discovery and learning, and we make them into little individuals in the classroom where they basically don't talk the Which whole day so long to each other. That's that's so anti-human, yeah. anti-God. It's a shame the way we turn them into little machines and automatrons. <laughs> okay, but George, how uh, uh, for you, because you were so passionate about this, how do you think, uh, speaking realistically again, how do you think that you can help to influence people or even provide some practical frameworks because this is not just about this is not about the internet really or online learning it's about communities everywhere and, and unfortunately i'm probably the last person to ask <laughs> talk to my wife but i think <laughs> i think you've brought up something um, that is worth discussing again or writing about future articles because it's uh, for me, it's a dream what you're mentioning because it's, yeah, it's like what we say, knock down the walls and take away all of that uh, organization and control. And I've seen, I've seen, we try to, like, Jason West did that kind of with English out there to get children on the streets or people on the streets speaking English or on social networks speaking English or, you know, like the, the lounge um, where people go into play or whatever. But, I, think, I mean, to really transform education completely the way you're saying is I, I don't huge. Think it, personally, I don't think it's possible. But um, we're... People will follow their passions. The most creativity, the most innovation is where someone is passionate for something. It, however you interpret passion, I don't care. Uh, but what you're passionate about, what a group of people are passionate about, that is thermonuclear yeah. <laughs> in comparison to um, conventional warfare. And so where we can tap into that, that's where the great strides come forward. There still needs to be the, the nuts and bolts. How do you do addition? How do you write <laughs> English that's understandable? That's still the nuts and bolts. But if you discover the passionate parts first, then that, can, that, that becomes almost easy in comparison. One of the vehicles that I prefer, one of the natural things that are a vehicle to keep people not necessarily passionate but comfortable is fun. That's what I continue to try to use as my main vehicle. But I know that the, even that is not maximized because people are not fun all the time. They're not laughing all the time. Um, our emotions and our minds um, have different modes to operate in and we need all of those but when I'm reaching out to people online or to groups of students um, song um, comic books um, uh, 
infographics, uh, finding the thing that's clicking with them. Are they a visual learner? Then infographics and diagrams are best. Do they love music? Can we, you know, that's a nice standard format that serves fluency, particularly in spoken and pronunciation. So there's there's many avenues, but they don't look traditional. And I don't uh, uh, uh. Okay, listen, yeah, I think, I think what I get from what you're saying is that all of this big change can happen from the inside out because uh, just by relaxing things a little bit in schools and by if, which I like, we can include blended learning so people like us who experiment can help people in more standard situations. Um, it's from the inside out that we get in touch with each child, the heart of each child. And we can do that just by seeing what they like to do, as you say, with music and games and all of that. Also, uh, when you talk about nuts and bolts like reading, writing, maths and all of that, all of those things, as you know, can be taught through the games and the music and the activities. So they don't have to be old fashioned or whatever, you know. So. Yeah, I think yeah, almost we've got, we got things backwards. Frameworks. Who got things backwards? If a child, if a, we as teachers, oh, yeah. uh, if, if a child is interested in rocket ships, why explain the grammatical nuances of, of uh, possessive <laughs> nouns? Now, once they try to explain that, once they try to write a paragraph about the rocket ship they just... Um, drew or created then we can introduce that and that's that whole thing with agenda driven stuff if yes. you follow the student with their passions they may decide not to focus on grammar for a year or two but during that time they've accumulated vocabulary they've accumula accumulated <laughs> concepts and their their mind is self-organizing around the thing they're passionate about when their mind is ready and they want to communicate with others, that's when they will naturally seek out better ways to write it, better ways to express it. Um, it's kind of like forcing a student to speak with total physical response before they're ready. Why force it? Yeah. If they're comfortable and they're able to follow along in a audible mode and a visual mode only, fine. Don't force <laughs> something into the equation. That's agenda driven rather than going with the flow, living exactly. in the now. Exactly. So it should be a need-to-know basis. But I think the whole point is um, that it's all about resources and the easiest way. So it's much easier to have children as little homogenized soldiers because then you could just dish out some knowledge and then go home. So that's, they just want to be like the But society needs that. And the students need that. There still needs to be a mixture. Discipline, um, yeah. Because we can't no. have total anarchy it's just that I still believe that we we're we're cutting out so much creativity innovation excellence by forcing everyone to meet the standardized system that industrialized education worked fine back then but in the information age it may not yeah, so it's a practical point of how how we can focus on one individual so much to bring out so much. And I think that um, it should start in the home and parents should learn how to do it first. You know, a lot of it, like you said, with homeschooling, if a lot happened at home, then it would be easier to continue in schools. But most households, uh, they, they don't know how to bring out that natural... Uh, curiosity in children in ways because some parents are very strict also or, or don't know um, the importance of toys or freedom for children or imagination. Many homes don't have anything yeah, for their children. That's looking backwards, trying to bring someone from the past up to the present or the future. Perhaps we should be looking forward that anticipation of the next generation by raising up this generation and introducing a more creative way to um, approach learning anything in life that then the next generation will have a different set of values and skills as you just brought up that there's uh, a lifetime 
of regimented learning is not broken by the best ideas, only by performance. So letting the students find their own way and then when they become the teachers and the parents of tomorrow, it, it just can't happen in the now because the now is dependent on what got you to this point. Kind of like the movie The Matrix. In The Matrix, yeah. they brought a man out of this false reality into the real reality and they told him that usually we don't take people your age because you're too ingrained in the matrix. So I think it's dangerous to try to assume that we can turn a teacher or a parent into this new creation, that they're too much established in their reality. Yeah, that's true. So I hope we can do it from now. Um, now I think we're almost finished. Just uh, there's the other part of the creative strategy about um, being a critic, but I think we have been kind of acting like critics for the past ten minutes, saying how we have to improve the system. Is there anything else you'd want to well, add? Uh, I mean, how, how do you criticize your own work or get feedback? I think one of the best systems because we are in the free enterprise system which is being introduced the world over through the internet and edupreneurs and entrepreneurial um, efforts to create a school online as an individual or a group that the <laughs> the market speaks with their money and their feet if customers keep Okay, George seems to have disappeared there. Um, well, I hope you enjoyed that discussion on creativity. As you can see, um, creativity is one of those open topics that we could just discuss forever. Um, I hope you've got some food for thought I have. And there is much to say about the future. And we're not the only ones talking about this. There are also interviews going on at Learn Out Live with Andre, Andre Klein, uh, where he's also asking teachers all over the world how they see the future of education. Okay, bye.